Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Thank you. Um, my youngest son looks like he probably has appendicitis, and my husband is not a doctor, so there's a lot going on. Inflammation, on <laughs> psychic and physical inflammation going on at home. So I appreciate the adjustment. Um, and we're going to talk about MCRPC, first and second line treatment options, and, and go through some conversations around chemotherapy as well. These are my disclosures. And I think as we've thought about a little bit and heard about um, many times, the therapeutic landscape for prostate cancer is increasingly complex. And we have numerous options already for our patients with more on the horizon and more being added actually, it seems almost day by day. So opportunities abound for us to try to control our patient's disease. And we'll go through again some of the first line MCRPC uh, type options and, and discuss chemotherapy and, and radium as well. I think importantly, as we consider all of these treatment choices, it's really important for us to think about some of the factors that can influence those decisions because as, as we currently sit here, there is no perfect sequence of how we get a patient from you know, hormone-sensitive metastatic disease through MCRPC and all of the phases of that. So it is really incumbent upon us to understand these treatment options so we can have those conversations with our patients and help them really make the right choices. The NCCN, um, like the AUA, has put together guidelines to try to help us think through this. And this slide is not here so that you memorize each of the boxes of metastatic CRPC treatment, but really to help us have a framework around which we can understand how to help make these decisions. The purpose of this, these boxes is to help us consider what the patient has used in the past as we then help them choose their next treatment moving forward. And it is really that constellation of clinical symptoms and metastatic sites and patient preferences plus their prior treatment exposures that helps us really make those next choices as we're moving forward. So in the upper left, you can see this patient has not had prior docetaxel or prior AR targeted agent. This is a first line MCRPC patient who's really only had ADT in the past. And the options for this patient include abiraterone, docetaxel, and zalutamide, as well as others, radium, cipulus, LT as well. Whereas a patient who has already had in the bottom right hand corner, prior docetaxel and a prior novel hormonal therapy, those options are going to be different and even include lutetium at this point, which is currently approved for patients who have had progression of disease after AR targeted agent and docetaxel chemotherapy if they have a PSMA PET that is positive. So again, understanding where we've been helps us strategize about where to go in the future. And ultimately it is novel mechanisms of action that we do need to rely on, the only exception to this would be that chemotherapy seems to work, cabazitaxel, even after progression of disease on docetaxel. But this concept, I think, is so, um, I would say beautifully, but also in a very concerning way, illustrated in this study that was published now a number of years ago, in which patients who had passed from prostate cancer underwent autopsies with uh, biopsies taken from multiple metastatic sites, and the investigators tried to understand how the uh, mutational patterns in these different metastatic sites may relate to each other so they could understand if these arose simply in that area of metastatic site or if there was travel of cells to different areas of metastatic disease and then sharing of some of these novel mechanisms of resistance. So um, what you can see is all of these lines connecting all of these metastatic sites and the primary prostate suggest that the clonal evolution of the resistance patterns in these metastatic areas was shared among these areas. So one area learns how to get around abiraterone, and that can educate other areas of metastatic disease so that they can also get around abiraterone and probably enzalutamide and probably other AR targeted agents. So really, this, uh, this is concerning. They learn, um, or at least share this information if we want to personify those metastases. Um, but it's something that we need to be keenly aware of as we're choosing the next treatment to, again, use a novel mechanism of action. So as I said, the clinical factors that we have to consider include exposure to prior treatments with a novel mechanism of action truly being preferred. We have to understand the uh, opportunities within our geographic location and, and the restraints that our practice may put on us. So which options are available in my practice location for my patient population? 
We also have to understand, are there visceral metastases, bone-only metastases? What does that burden of disease look like? Where are, those, where are the areas of metastatic disease? We have to understand the fitness of the patient and whether he is actually going to be able to tolerate something like chemotherapy or whether this is something that is not going to um, be helpful to him but may be more harmful than helpful if his performance status is greater than two. Um, we have to remember, and you'll hear about this, I think, in another talk with Dr. Lang, about small cell and neuroendocrine differentiation. And this is a histology that is going to be treated in a different way and absolutely needs to be identified as we're caring for these patients. We need to understand whether there are targetable DNA repair defect mutations or if the patient has MSI high tumor status, because as we heard from Dr. Gamela's talk, this gives us opportunities to use our targeted PARP inhibitor therapies and potentially pembrolizumab. And always clinical trials should be something that we consider, especially as certain medications may not be available through standard of care, but are still available for patients who enroll in clinical trials, things like lutetium PSMA 617. So as we think about androgen receptor signaling inhibitors, which we just heard about, um, this is again going to be an option for MCRPC patients who have not had prior exposure and progression of disease. If the patient has potentially had prior exposure but has not had disease <coughs> progression on an AR signaling inhibitor, perhaps this is something to consider, but that would be a relatively rare situation. Abiraterone acetate is the first AR signaling inhibitor that was approved in MCRPC. This is approved both before before and after chemotherapy, and we'll look at the data related to that in just a moment. We heard already about the side effects being things like fluid retention, hypertension, and so we have to be thinking about the cardiac status, the fluid status of our patients, um, and then we've already just heard about which patients are poor candidates. The Cougar 301 study is the study that investigated abiraterone acetate in the MCRPC setting after progression of disease on docetaxel, and clearly we see a survival benefit here and a hazard ratio suggesting improved survival with it being at 0.65 for ADT and the addition of abiraterone versus uh, ADT and placebo. So approved first in the post-docetaxel state, but then also approved based on the Cougar 302 trial in the pre-docetaxel state. Uh, and this is the way that all of these drugs are developed in the most advanced settings, and then we walk them back to use them in earlier disease states. So also approved um, and useful in the pre-chemotherapy state. And zalutamide, as we just heard, is another AR signaling inhibitor that, as we just heard, can be associated with seizure, though that is rare, and hypertension, which can be more common. Uh, so we do need to think about that. Also approved in MCRPC before or after chemotherapy. The AFFIRM trial is the after chemotherapy trial demonstrating that benefit to ADT and enzalutamide versus ADT and placebo. And the PREVAIL trial um, is the study that looked at the pre-chemotherapy space with ADT and enzalutamide being beneficial in the MCRPC setting uh, versus ADT and placebo, again, pre-docetaxel chemotherapy. So it's approved across the, across the spectrum, um, pre- or post-chemotherapy, but we do want to make sure we understand prior exposures there. Um, and chemotherapy can be something the patients had, should not affect response to enzalutamide. And then as I've said or alluded to actually multiple times, we don't want to back-to-back -back <coughs> sequence or even sequence with something in between AR signaling inhibitors. There's multiple studies, just a few listed on this slide, that suggest minimal response to the second AR targeting agent in the MCRPC setting after progression of disease on a prior AR signaling inhibitor. This is even true if you have some minimal response to enzalutamide after abiraterone. That response is generally going to be a PSA response at best and short-lived, maybe a couple of months, but uh, most patients will progress and will progress rel relatively quickly. Uh, the PLATO trial demonstrated this. This was an interesting study of patients who were treated uh, with enzalutamide and on progression were randomized to enzalutamide plus abiraterone versus uh, abiraterone. And here we can see that the best PSA response was, for most patients, actually a rising PSA. So uh, we also see time to PSA progression really being at that three-month mark when we check PSA. So we have to recognize, I think, that even if you get a momentary benefit out of the second AR targeted agent, that is expected to be minimal at best for a majority of our patients. And we also know that if we lose time and start effective therapies later, we lose time and survival in most cases. So getting to an effective treatment early is really, really important. Uh, just a few more examples. The PROFOUND trial is uh, a trial we will hear more about, MCRPC. Patients who are selected to have HRR mutations. 
Um, and we could see that there were two cohorts here, a cohort A, which included patients with BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM alterations. Cohort B included all the other alterations that were assessed in the, and made that patient eligible for the trial. Patients had had MCRPC and had had disease progression on an AR signaling inhibitor. And they were randomized, both cohorts, to Olaparib versus the alternate AR signaling inhibitor. And what we can see with the red arrow on the right-hand side is that the control arm here, which is the alternate AR signaling inhibitor, demonstrates a median progression that's around the time of the first scan at three months. So again, most patients going to be progressing <coughs> relatively quickly here, and we're not meaningfully prolonging for a majority of our patients progression-free survival if we're using the alternate AR signaling inhibitor um, when would they have had progression on the first one. The median PFS here, 3.5 months. So to shift gears a little bit and think about some of these novel mechanisms of action, Cipulucel T is a, an agent that has been approved now for about a decade, um, is a bit of a complex therapy. If we look at this diagram, it tries to help us sort of put together the pieces of how this drug is um, manifest and how it works. Patients undergo phoresis where their antigen presenting cells are drawn off and they're cultured with this PAP or prostate, prostate acid phosphatase protein that is conjugated to a GMCSF um, uh, molecule that is then used to expand cells here. As you can see, those APCs learn how to present the PAP, prostate acid phosphatase um, protein, so that when it is reinfused back into the patient, it is used to educate the T cells as to what that looks like, what that protein looks like, so the T cells can then attack the prostate cancer cells. So really, I think, pretty elegant and thoughtful. Um, it's, it's complex, though, to, to put it all together. The impact study is what looked at Cipulucel T in MCRPC patients who were asymptomatic. They did not have visceral metastases like liver metastases, uh, as an example. Um, and what we saw is that even though progression-free survival was not prolonged with Cipulucel T, there was a prolongation in overall survival here, um, the hazard ratio demonstrating a statistically significant benefit in terms of reducing mortality. So um, we see that the median overall survival is about four months longer with treatment with Cipulucel T than with the placebo. Interestingly, lutetium PSMA 617 also has a four-month improvement in overall survival, and all of the drugs that we're talking about today in the MCRPC setting have an improvement in median overall survival of somewhere around two and a half to four and a half months. So just something to keep in mind. We're kind of doing the same amount of time over and over with some of our patients hopefully getting a much longer improvement in overall survival um, than the median. So we also have some understanding, I think, of Cipulu cell T and which populations may benefit more or less. And what this demonstrates is that when we look at lower PSAs, lower baseline PSAs for patients who are receiving treatment, the lower the PSA, the better the response to Cipulu cell T seems to be, with a hazard ratio here of 0.51 for those patients with a PSA that is less than 22. Uh, and I think this is something I think about in my practice. These are asymptomatic patients generally with a relatively slowly progressive disease into MCRPC. Um, it is not the patient with visceral crisis. It is not the patient with many symptoms. Um, and so often these patients will have a lower PSA. And if we can integrate something like Cipulucel T, perhaps we can get some benefit out of that. Also interestingly, there was an analysis within the PROCEED registry, which is a registry that was um, used to deliver Cipulu cell T and to monitor and follow results. And they found that patients who were African American did tend to have a, a, a larger improvement in median overall survival with treatment with Cipulu cell T than their uh, Caucasian counterparts. So it, just another piece of information that seems to be, I think, something that holds up. And again, here the, the data on the PSA being less than median, which in this case was 29, um, did seem to designate a population that had uh, a greater benefit from Cipulu cell T here with a hazard ratio of 0.52. So these are, as I said, asymptomatic patients. They do need a life expectancy of at least six months, which is generally the type of patient, if that patient is asymptomatic, that's what we would expect, usually, a longer life expectancy. And this is because Cipulucel T does not cause the PSA to go down. It does not cause an immediate decrease in disease burden. It is something that we expect will be uh, effective, potentially, over time with that immune response benefiting the patient in the long term. <coughs> 
Radium-223 is another one of our options in the metastatic CRPC setting. And this is an interesting drug because it is a calcium mimetic, meaning that when it's infused into the patient, it acts like calcium does in the body. And you can see that that, uh, that alkali earth metals column there, that family uh, on the periodic table demonstrating that radium is in the same in the same family as calcium. So if we think back to our chemistry days, maybe this all makes a little bit more sense. In any event, when radium is infused, as I said, it acts as a calcium mimetic and is taken up into areas of bone turnover uh, where it is integrated into that structure and then undergoes alpha radioactive decay. Um, that is a very high energy particle that is a large particle, travels only six to 10 cell, cell lengths away from its initial integration and kills the cells in its wake, does not make the person radioactive because these alpha particles do not exit um, much farther than that six to, cent to 10 cell lengths. They do not get out of the bone, they do not, um, certainly don't leave the body and the person is not radioactive. Again, different than lutetium PSMA 617, which is a beta emitting radiopharmaceutical and the person does emit some radioactivity for a few days uh, after initial treatment. The ALSIMCA trial is the trial that led to the approval of radium-223. In this study, patients with MCRPC who had symptomatic disease, they could have had prior docetaxel or they could have refused or been ineligible for prior docetaxel, were treated with radium versus placebo, and radium was associated with about a four-month improvement in overall survival um, here, as we can see in this statistically significant hazard ratio of 0.7. When we look at patients by prior docetaxel use versus no prior docetaxel use, we can see a very similar hazard ratio suggesting a similar benefit across the board. And we also know that there are some predisposing factors perhaps for hematologic to toxicity, uh, including prior use of docetaxel maybe uh, slightly affecting things here, having more bone metastases and having that alkaline phosphatase being higher. So should we use radium-223 after or before chemotherapy? I think that really depends on the conversation that you have with your patient. We do know that um, when we are able to give six cycles or six doses of, of radium-223, we are able to get more benefit for our patients. Just like any treatment that we give, I think the earlier that we give it, the more benefit we seem to see from that particular agent. Um, and when we can give six doses, we do seem to find more benefit. Um, we are more likely to do that in a pre versus a post chemotherapy setting, which is something to think about. Uh, but we do need to have adequate cell counts and we also need to have uh, an infrastructure that includes that multidisciplinary team that can support us in delivering this therapy. The ideal patient for docetaxel is the one we'll talk about next, and we're kind of winding down now on these earlier treatment options for MCRPC. Docetaxel it has traditionally been used in symptomatic MCRPC in patients who had not previously received docetaxel in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. I would say that in some instances, we do consider reusing docetaxel when the time since prior exposure in metastatic hormone sensitive disease may be a little bit longer, um, and the patient seems to potentially have had a nice benefit from docetaxel taxol in the hormone sensitive stage, we could consider retreating. Um, this is what we often reach for as medical oncologists when the patient does have visceral crisis, maybe disease in the liver that's expanding. If the patient has cord compression um, and needs to have therapy with systemic treatment, as we would expect, after our local treatment with surgery or with radiation. Um, and so, and, and often, I think in clinical practice, this is going to be after we've already had exposure for our patient to an AR signaling inhibitor, perhaps in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. So TAX327 is the study that initially led to approval here. You can see the date of this New England Journal of Medicine article, 2004, and it still remains, I think, a really important piece of uh, and option for our patients with MCRPC and, and in earlier stages as well with, with metastatic prostate cancer. And here you can see that the Q3-week dosing was superior to mitoxantrone, which was the which was the control arm here, and it was also superior to weekly docetaxel, um, which was the other option included in this trial. Cabazitaxel is our other chemotherapy for metastatic CRPC. It is not used uh, before docetaxel at this time unless there's a compelling reason perhaps around the side effect profile for your particular patient. And you can see the structural similarity to docetaxel between docetaxel and cabazitaxel on this slide. <laughs> 
The Tropic trial is what led to the approval of cabazitaxel in the MCRPC setting in the post-docetaxel patient population. And you could see patients were randomized between cabazitaxel and mitoxantrone, so a chemotherapy randomization uh, and cabazitaxel here led to a, a significant improvement in overall survival, although that median survival in months is actually relatively small. The most frequent adverse events here are things that we might expect from chemotherapy, including cytopenias, as well as a, a, some level of nausea, GI-type effects. Uh, neuropathy is less common with cabazitaxel than it is with docetaxel. So uh, particularly in patients with a history of neuropathy, perhaps unrelated to their prostate cancer, but maybe diabetic neuropathy or other neuropathy, this can be a good option. And that is one reason that we sometimes move cabazitaxel before, uh, before docetaxel. In our, in our clinical practices. Otherwise, it is uh, something that we do have to be aware of. So we have here hematologic toxicities and deaths that can be associated um, with these drugs. But I would say that the, the risk of death related to neutropenic fever is, is low, especially when we use growth factor, which we always do here in the United States. Additionally, I would comment that in the TROPIC trial, the drug was initially tested at a 25 milligram per meter squared dose, which is higher than the dose we typically use in daily practice now. Um, we typically use a 20 milligram per meter squared dose because we know it generally appears as effective in terms of disease control, though may have a little slower ability to get that greatest um, or maximum uh, response. It is effective and is more tolerable. The ProSelica study is what compared, as we see here, cabazitaxel 20 to cabazitaxel 25. And the overall survival in this randomized trial demonstrated that these two doses were similar, which is why we tend to use the 20 milligram per meter squared dose. And here we can see treatment-related adverse events um, that, again, nothing new and, and, and unexpected with from the initial cabazitaxel um, studies. But we can see that the 25 did have a little bit of a higher risk, of especially grade three to four treatment-related adverse events, and higher rates of febrile neutropenia, as you can see highlighted here. The CARD study is what looked at cabazitaxel within the MCRPC setting as it comes to being sequenced after docetaxel and uh, after an initial AR targeted agent, and I think you're going to be hearing more about this from Dr. Lang. So in summary, treatment of men with metastatic CRPC continues to evolve rapidly. General principles are really what we need to fall back on as we're making these treatment choices with our patients. We have multiple options. There isn't a right sequence that, that has been defined for us to use. So we need to have those shared decisions. We need to think about our, uh, our prior exposures to prior therapies. We need to make sure that we're trying to use options other than an AR signaling inhibitor followed by an AR signaling inhibitor inhibitor. Um, and we do need to think about the patient, too, um, what he has, uh, what he's willing to do, what his preferences are, what his fitness is, what his distribution of metastatic disease is, and how we can be be best make all of those come together, not just for this treatment, but hopefully to use treatments over time as we kind of move the pieces around the chessboard in treatment of metastatic CRPC. And Dr. Lang will talk more about that sequencing. So thank you for your time. <laughs>